<clears throat> kumquats. We learned about those today, huh? What did Tom say? That there's like five or six that can be grown here in Southern California. Um, these are the two that I know of that I've seen before, especially up here in the Riverside Citrus Belt. Um, and what's really cool about these is that they're a special niche. There's a special market for them right now. And um, I know a lot of Riverside growers that are now starting to get into these because, because they are such a little special niche that they do have. And like Tom said, they are the most cold sensitive. So if you live within a valley or between mountains, that's a, that's a little cold pocket. Uh, these guys will do fairly well there. Now when it comes to, <laughs> speaking of cold, um, I just wanted to show this really quick. I know it's not a citrus tree. I couldn't find one. But um, a lot of the times, I know here in Riverside County, I'm sure Gary's probably seen this too, you, you'll you get um, windburn. And a lot of people think, oh, it's my top road or something wrong with my tree. And uh, here we have the, the Santa, and the winds, yeah. And I don't know if they hit San Diego so much, do they? Oh, yeah. Oh, they do? Okay, okay. So when it comes to, I actually jumped into the site selection part of it, actually. Um, this is kind of place, but uh, be very careful on also where you put it. You don't want to, like, let's say you have a slope you back here, you don't want to put it at the very top of the hill where it's just going to get slammed, um, slammed by the cold. And usually you'll see the pattern, um, pattern on one side. Uh, where the wind blows and I do get a lot of calls from this we have people coming hey my tree's on I don't know what's wrong I checked the weather we had the winds the week before you know so that's something you just want to keep an eye out and make sure you want to protect your smaller tree and it's mostly common in the, in the smaller younger trees because they have citrus and avocado mm -hmm. um, so now we're going into the site selection um, like we said most citrus freezes at 26 degrees <coughs> Lemon freezes at 29, a little bit less tolerant. Um, when you plant a tree, you don't want to put them in the lawn that requires a frequent shallow irrigation. Uh, they compete a lot with the grass, especially um, what's the grass? Bermuda grass, <coughs> crab grass. Oh man, those things are really competitive with the smaller trees and uh, you want to be careful where you place your tree. Um, you want to plant on the south side of the house to increase heat units and plant in well-drained soils. Um, it's hard to do if you have a clay soil, if it's a really thick soil. What I've seen some people do, and I've seen this as well, um, you dig a hole, like let's say the night, the night before you plant, you dig a hole, I don't know, about a foot or so. Fill it up with water and see how long it takes to drain. And if it's still there by tomorrow morning, maybe it's not an area you want to plant at because it's taking forever and the water just logs there. And um, that would be really bad for the roots of your new citrus tree. Um, you want to plant in the spring or fall, for sure once February is over. But I don't know, this weather's been kind of off, so I don't know what to tell you guys now, but these are more of guidelines. Uh, don't plant it too deep. Don't add fertilizer or mulch to the backfill, um, unless you have a clay soil, then you might want to have to you know, play with the components in that aspect. Uh, you want to protect it from sunburn, especially on smaller trees. I don't know if you guys seen them at Lowe's or even when you guys go out to the huge growers, they have that little piece of cardboard that's still stuck. That's actually there to protect from the sun. So that's one way you guys can purchase one of those. If not, just keep the tree when it's actually like that. If not, you can use a, like, um, you can paint it, you can use the whitewash, just um, do not use a oil-based paint. <laughs> you wanna use the latex for that. Citrus need full sun and space. This can interfere with your neighbors. Be careful where you plant it. Don't plant it too close to the fence um, or too close to your neighbor's yard because they will get large. Um, lemons are probably the worst. <laughs> They're just, they just have their own growing mentality. They'll just do what they want, when they want, especially if you don't prune them on a regular basis, they can kind of get out of control and become a nuisance. And since they do produce a lot of fruit, that fruit's gonna be dropping everywhere and just makes a mess, so. Also, don't plant them too close together. Remember I was talking about the close, that maybe you want a couple of different varieties to get the pollination going? 
make sure you have some distance between them. They don't need to be that close because um, then you get a big old jungle mess and it's almost impossible to prune once it gets bigger. <clears throat> so remember how I mentioned that grass is very competitive? Um, the picture to the left is kind of what you want to do. You want to clear out the space because um, the picture to the right, uh, the trees are going to start struggling and competing for it. And um, I've seen people use Roundup. Um, you can you can, <laughs> you can use Roundup, just uh, make sure it doesn't hit the bark that much. Like I said, it is a contact herbicide, so it will cause some damage, but it won't bring down a whole tree unless you dump it in it. So if there's a couple of specks that land on it, then you should be okay. Um, or you can do it by hand, or get the site ready before you plant, mm -hmm. which is my suggestion for that. Okay, mulching. Um, Mulching can usually be applied during the spring. It's actually uh, something you might want to consider. You usually apply about uh, half a foot, and you want to apply it once a year. Uh, make sure do not cover the bud union. Do you guys all know what the bud union is? Um, I've seen a couple of trees that were planted and just stunted their growth. The trees just weren't producing anything. Uh, I, I have yet to see one die from it, but it really does a number on them and stresses them out, which could cause secondary things for that. Um, when you do put mulch, never use straw or grass. You think when you mow your lawn, you want to dump that on there? No, you don't want to do that. It's the last thing you want to do. Um, it reduces air and increases carbon and just makes a big old mess out of it. I'm sure you guys have seen this. This is the water table. Uh, mind you, this is just a guideline. It's almost impossible to really say how much do you water. You really have to know your property and you have to uh, know your tree, especially the size of it. Um, I have this. Okay, that, that doesn't show. Okay, so to the left side of the table, you have the canopy and diameter, so how round the tree is. And then on the very top, you have the months, January all the way to December. Uh, usually in the winter months, you may not use as much water because it's cold and there isn't that much sunlight. But I don't know what's happening now. <laughs> it's been sunny this entire time. So uh, remember, it's just a guideline. Uh, these numbers, give and take, they have a 25% uh, loss that you can take into consideration for this. And it seems like July and August is where you're going to need the most water. And this is gallons a day. So if you have a huge tree, that's what, yeah, you're going to, in July, you're going to need 37 gallons of water a day to maintain it. And I'm not saying put it all out at once. <laughs> you know, you want to space it out. You don't want to stress that tree out so that. And like I said, this is just a guideline. And um, you can tell when, you're, when, when your trees are going to start stressing because there's not enough water. That's usually the case with too much water. Especially with the drought and the cutbacks with the with the county and stuff, you can only water on certain days, or you can only apply a certain amount. You want to be a little bit more careful. It's better to Gary. What do you think? Is it better to irrigate more in smaller amounts, or do like a leach? Like you mean um, when you apply the water? Because like let's say you can only water on Tuesdays and Wednesdays or something. Is it better to do it all at once and put all the 36 gallons on at one time or space it out? Well, like the, it's, a, it's a conundrum because we got salt in our water and we need to leach the salt out um, in order to get good production, but then you don't want drying in between either. So um, take your take your best guess, I guess. Yeah, like, well, yeah, because yeah, like I said, it depends on how old your tree is or how sensitive your tree is. And you can kind of start knowing your tree. That. I, maybe I can add something to that. You know, the Isra Israelis invented drip irrigation back, I think, in the early 70s. And the idea over there was to put on this, the exact same amount of water the trees used each day. They put a lot of water on all the time. So the salts really never got concentrated. They kept kind of flowing down. So, but, but as soon as you start to stretch it out, the, the, the roots can exclude salt at some point, but then, the, then it starts to flood in and you get a lot of salt damage. So, you know, I think the, probably the recommendation is to get a little bit more often uh, when you have to cut back, but then you got to leach once in a while. Yeah, yeah. And 
And then what we've seen in the avocado, which right here is going to mention that, oh, okay, we're going to get rain, so I'm going to cut off my water, and I'm not going to put water this time. Well, all the salts have accumulated because you only got one inch of water, and that wasn't enough to finish leaching, so technically your tree didn't get enough water like it should have. Especially here, for some reason, Riverside and Northern San Diego County, I feel like we get ripped off with, like, rain. It's like it goes over us, and it doesn't really stay, or we only get, like, 20 minutes while Los Angeles is being flooded. So, I don't, I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. That's why what you asked for. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Yeah. And usually you can tell when, you're wa when your tree doesn't have enough water. Usually the, the leaves will start cupping. Um, if they're still cut in the morning hours, that shows that the plant is stressed. You, you know, you want them to be nice and flat to take in the sun rays when it first comes in the morning. But if they're cut, that means they're starting to get stressed. Uh, you may start to see fruit drop and um, fruit that is still attached to the tree will actually sometimes get soft from that. You, you can like feel the rind and it starts to get soft. And then leaves at the end of the branches will start to fall off. So that's another sign too. That they start falling from the outwards in. And usually, oh thank you. And usually, okay. And usually lemons always require a little bit more water. So that first chart I, I showed you, you know, you just want to add a little bit more for that. Um, then you guys have seen this, right? All yeah. over the place. Um, this generally occurs uh, following stress of extreme hot weather combined with high winds and drought or by heavy watering. Um, what what usually happens is that if you don't apply water, it starts to get really tight and dry. You put those 36 gallons of water on there probably in one day, and if you're not consistent, they're going to get full full of fluid again and then finally just burst. Mm. So that's like a really good sign of showing that maybe you're not watering uh, how you should be. <clears throat> a good way of uh, finding out is I usually have a shovel with me and usually you know you don't want to get too close to where like the roots are and you know cause some damage you know just get a shovel just uh take out like not even a quarter of like three to four inches of soil you want to go deep and you see that soil line uh, Top. yeah right here you know you want to make sure that the first few inches are always moist if it's dry, maybe you need to pour more water on. Um, fertilizing. Um, citrus loves nitrogen and they require it each year. Um, you want to apply in late January or February before it blooms. Um, you want to apply the second time in May and maybe third in June. Uh, trees usually need a zinc spray, especially with too much manure from it from an organic nitrogen program. Uh, if you're going the organic way, uh, this slide I actually uh, took from Gary, and on the right side you're going to see the suggestion rates. Uh, you want to divide it into two or three times. You want to apply it for a new tree, so you have the first year, second year, third year, and fourth year, and fifth year. So that's the amount of nitrogen, and as you see, it increases as the tree gets bigger. So you apply it those three times that are located to the left, and then uh, that certain amount of nitrogen for that. Are we talking ammonium sulfate or what kind of nitrogen? Um, usually you can, like urea. Urea would probably be best. But ammonium sulfate can make soils more, really pretty acidic, you know. Urea is probably the most popular of that. Um, organic nitrogen fertilizer. This is where it starts getting a little bit tricky. Um, commercial growers usually usually use a 50 pound bag of easy greens, which is basically chicken manure, uh, per tree, half applied before bloom and half in the late summer. It's only about 3% nitrogen. Uh, the only backfire with that, as you guys know, is that the manures usually make a, a zinc deficiency worse um, due to the high phosphorus content. Um, and definitely be careful with the organic. You definitely don't want to get anywhere near the bloom because you could really cause some damage. And then we talk about what is nitrogen, really, um, the actual nitrogen that goes into the plant. So this is a small scenario. 
One pound of actual nitrogen is about five pounds of ammonium sulfate per year, or 100 pounds of, com of composted cow manure each year. Organic fertilizers such as manure, blood meal, etc., could be applied in, in the fall. So a uh, ratio of 15, 15, 15 has about 1.5 pounds of nitrogen and 10 pounds. You really need to put a lot in consistent. And that's why most of the organic groves that I have seen, they're always nutrient deficient. There's always some type because they're always trying to put manure on and it's just never enough. And they only put it on once a year or maybe twice a year if those trees are lucky. So they're always nutrient deficient, unfortunately, because it's organic. It's not enough. Um, that's actually one of the groves that I did visit, as you guys see. See the yellowing of it being deficient. This was the guy that only applied manure once a year to his organic field. So um, technically he wasn't getting enough nitrogen in his trees. Another very common thing that we see is zinc deficiency. Uh, you can tell the, the because of um, the yellowing between the veins. You know, it just pops right out at you. It may not be apparent at first, but once you start seeing your trees getting stressed out, you're going to see those veins popping out. Um, now we're going into the pruning really quick. Training, pruning, and thinning. Uh, do not do not prune in late February or early March, because um, that's right before the spring and growth flush. You're going to you're going to prevent that from actually happening. Uh, because that's when the maximum amount of food is stored within the leaves. So try to refrain from doing pruning during during that time. And um, research has shown that you should never use a tree seal. I don't know if you guys have seen that before, where you don't want the tree to get infected. You don't want you know. But actually, it has been proven that you actually want to leave it alone. But then you also want to make your pruning cuts to where it's not a big old hole. Either you know you want to cut at a certain you know a 60 degree angle or a certain angle versus just chopping it because then you're leaving the surface area there bare. So also be careful on how you prune, and uh, we do not recommend you putting any type of tree wound stuff to cover it up on there because you're not letting the tree heal itself, which is what you want. Um, and you can also make your own mixture. Um, Bordax? Is that what it's called here? Bordeaux. 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 See, I don't see you guys know what I'm not using. Bordeaux. Um, that's something that you can buy from the store. You can also uh, mix it yourself. Um, probably that would be the best thing if you are concerned or want to, but most of the time you should be okay with it by itself. Um, young citrus trees and mature trees don't require actually much pruning. Uh, you just want to make sure you get the suckers, especially when they're younger. You guys are seeing those little suckers coming out. You just want to get those in control because uh, you don't want them to start taking off and confusing the tree and it become a dominant branch and ruin the tree. You want to uh, make sure you take care of that. Um, fruit thinning is not required, but you should um, ex um, expect a small piece-sized fruit to fall off in June. Uh, pruning the skirts um, will allow you to get beneath the tree uh, to apply copper bands and and just so you can see uh, when I when I was growing up I lived in a citrus grove believe it or not and but within our yard we had three trees that we did have we never really um, skirted them never cut them but then we always noticed there was always rats in there rats live in citrus trees they love a non pruned citrus tree so I don't know if you guys have experience with that or um, possums too they like they like going up there too, but 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 if it's nice and clean, it kind of pushes them away just a little bit from that. Um, the only exception for pruning is lemons. Remember how I was saying that they kind of do their own thing, and you want to make sure that they don't uh, continue to grow out of control. You want to maintain uh, your lemons. <clears throat> so these are the top pests and disease. Um, these will probably be your most common calls that you guys will get is a lot of disease um, pests, um, leaf miners, ants, California red scales, new bugs, snail uh, diseases. We have the Phytophthora. Um, and then I actually have a CDFA person going out next week to someone's backyard because they think that, because they found psyllids 
and they think they have the Hong Long Bean. So, you know, it's called like that. There's a there's a special responsibility that you have when you do have citrus, and that's unfortunately that's going to be one of the ones that's going to be fairly more common for that. So we know that it spreads the bacteria to the citrus. It's, the psyllid itself doesn't kill the tree, it's the bacteria that when it feeds it spits back up and goes into the tree and that's what causes uh, the tree to start declining. We know that Florida has already lost a lot of its citrus just because of this guy. And the history goes back is that they didn't know they had it because the tree won't show symptoms for four to six years. So, your tr so you don't even know that your tree is sick. And so by the time Florida figured out six years later, hey, what's going on with these trees? Guess what? That bug spread from tree to tree to tree to tree to tree to grove to grove. And that's when they had that fall, that fallout with it. And the bacteria, it makes the fruit really bitter to where you can't even use it for juice. Cattle won't even eat it. So you have a complete loss of the entire uh, commodity. And uh, we have found it in Hacienda Heights. We have found, um, well, this is one, but I think if I remember correctly, they found it in seven trees now as of today. And uh, we don't know where it came from or how it happened. And the, com the, the, the larger growers that are on a strict spray plan and so th I think the growers have it in control. What we're worried about are the backyard growers because uh, we do know that you guys, most people don't have a spray program that you do. So most of the time the tree just gets left there. Um, so um, you guys may get a lot of calls about that. Hey, I think I have, you know, the disease, the citrus psyllid and whatnot. And like I said, not all the citrus psyllids carry the bacteria. So that's why that we've been spared in some areas. Because that one tree, that first tree they found, the guy was an amateur back, backyard grafter person. You know? Oh, and, and, so we don't know where it came yeah, from. He gave trees to his friends, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They don't have it. Um, so this is where um, the citrus psyllid has been found. As you guys see, there is a lot of citrus up north in the San Joaquin Valley, Kings, Tulare, and Fresno, but they're not. Uh, they don't have as many organic growers as we do here in Southern California. For some reason here in Southern California, we, we, we can get away with a lot of biocontrol because of the weather. You know, it's really good for that. Um, in Northern California, you know, we have extreme heat and extreme cold, so they don't really use, so they're real conventional. So they have a strict spray program there. So even if they did have it, we, we, they even really don't see the psyllid as much as we do here in Southern California. And um, there have been a couple of instances in Tulare County where they have found the citrus psyllid. They've been tested positive, but they've been under quarantine. But here in Southern California, it's like we have the perfect setup for it to actually thrive. So most of the time, the psyllids, uh, they hide beneath the leaf. So, you, so when you're looking for it, if they're just not gonna pop out at you. You're gonna have to look beneath the canopy and beneath the leaves to actually find it. And uh, this is what the eggs look like. And then um, you're also going to see that waxy honeydew that they do produce. And sometimes you'll just see the waxy honeydew and you won't even see this, the citrus psyllid. You're like, where is this coming from? Because they're so, cause they're so tiny and small. And um, don't be surprised if CDFA just walks into your backyard and you, know, you see somebody in uniform do that because uh, they have a lot of workers working on this. and. Uh, sometimes they'll go to your backyard and spray or let's say your county has been quarantined because they did find something positive um, get ready for people to start knocking on doors and um, CDFA is a really good um, uh, uh, state state uh, place to where they can uh, where they can help you and like I said I, I have someone coming out to someone else's backyard because they want to catch it early so they will, so they will work with you on that. Um, so if you are really concerned, or if you know someone that lives within the area that has been quarantined, you know there are some things that you can do to protect your trees. Um, if, if that's if CDFA doesn't come knock on your door and ask to treat your trees, which sometimes they will do. Um, the pyganic, um, I said the only part about the organic 
herbicides is that it's a little more pricier and you have to be applying it more often because it doesn't last as long as the conventional ones would. And um, you have to do it a little bit more for that. And unfortunately, there is no cure. No one can figure out how to cure this thing. Once the tree has it, they have it. So the best thing to do is to quarantine. Um, there's been a lot of talk. I know Berkeley has some really good genetic programs going on. And um, they're thinking about, well, what if we completely destroy the psyllid? What if we, you know, bred them to where they didn't have that bacteria inside their gut and we release a set of males and females or just get rid of the female? You know, there's a lot of things that go into that. Or what if we genetically modify a citrus tree to be resistant against it? You know, and they did, a, it was really funny. Um, at Berkeley, they did a survey where they asked people, would you rather have no juice? and no citrus or get it from a GMO tree. And it was about 50-50, believe it or not. And that's what at Berkeley, and they're a little bit more liberal. So people are willing to turn their heads, you know, uh, to, bio, to biotechnology just to save our tree. Well, the thing about the spinach gene, though, that's a GMO, but you're inserting a gene from a plant you already eat. It's not some, some wild insect bug or something, you know, something, that, <laughs> something that humans don't eat. So. It is a, a GMO, but, you know, I, I don't see how you can say that's going to harm you. So. Yeah, there's, it's just the, the public perception. Yeah. Yeah, that's the big thing about it. Um, here in Southern California, uh, Dr. Hoddle, he's an entomologist here out of UCR. He's actually working on a biocontrol that, um, that can control the psyllid, the Hemorexia. It's a parasitic wasp um, that came from Pakistan. I believe they're on their third year on seeing how it's doing and controlling. Unfortunately, with biocontrol, there is a lag time because you are dealing with live creatures and the weather, and and um, you need to wait to see what's going to happen. And so, populations have been released to Los Angeles, San Bernardino, and Riverside County. Uh, there are also some in Imperial and Northern San Diego County. So they are there and um, they release them and they are doing fairly well reproducing. But in the first couple of years, we just need to make sure that they reproduce and survive. And let's wait to see what they actually do in terms of their biocontrol. Uh, there's two different ways that they can kill the citrusilid, nymphs. They can parasitize it. Uh, a female can lay an egg underneath. Um, the actual little scale that it's made out of, or by host feeding, um, the female uses the uh, ovipositor and um, it stabs little nymphs and it goes in that way, so this little guy. Um, but the only thing that uh, Mark Hoddle was saying that's been a struggle with this is remember how I was telling you guys that, it, that the nymphs create a honeydew? What eats the honeydew? Ants. Exactly, the ants. So now we're having a problem with the ants. So we need to control our ants before we can control the citrus psyllid. And um, and these guys work together. You know, the ants eat and then they get protected, and it's just one big cycle that's messing things up. So uh, so now Hoddle's working on a new ant control. You know, so we got to control the ants before we even get there. Yes. Is there any concern that that wasp might kill other beneficials? Like, how do they know it's only killing that particular butterflies? Um, Mark Hoddle has done research at least five years before he even released it. So he looked into what it could do to the ecology and what, and so far that parasitic wasps, the only thing they want are psyllids. So as of right now, there has been no concern. And he, you know, and I'm pretty sure that he did a lot of specific testing in the lab before these things were released because we know what happened to the European starling. You know, you bring a you bring a new thing from a different country to try and it just goes out of control somehow. Um, yeah, but so far so good. They're on their third year and they've had no problems or no things with that. Um, yes. I know our mom was like, this is a weird question, but does the um, Asian citrus salad does it have any benefit to the environment, or what is, 
like, does it have any positive? Or I mean, I know it's negative here. Um, but then also, um, my other question was simply. Sorry, I forgot my other question. Um, but anyway, <laughs> back to it. Does it have any positive benefits? Oh, um, it, does it also have any additional predators that it takes care of? Like, or what is it? Sorry, two questions. Sorry, I'm really tired. Um, <laughs> if you can't tell. Um, okay, so does it have a benefit? And um, does the Asian citrus villain, like, is there. Sorry, I'm just going to look back for a moment. What is it after? I guess, what is it after? Is it yeah. after something that only the citrus trees provide? Yeah. Or does it have something that is in other plants that I, are outside of the community? I know of, it's an invasive pest. It, it's, that doesn't even belong here. It came here, um, I don't know how long ago, but it's, it's not native. 2008, so it's not even native to the United States or California. Native to China. Yeah, so there's no place for it in our ecology. So, and it just happens to uh, predominantly uh, uh, go for citrus. You know, it it does have other hosts, but its preference will always go towards, and then it will fly and make its way to find its citrus. So. Uh, we have no natural predators for it as of now. That's how we had to bring something in from a different country just to get it. Yeah, that was how to plant China control it. Because citrus is from Asia, so. Oh my god, that's a good question. There that's probably oh, that's there. true. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, they said that they had some commercial citrus growers over here from, from southeastern China. And they said their their commercial citrus groves. A lot of times, they only last seven or eight years. And they have to pull them out and replace wow. them. And they couldn't believe that we have this parent navel wow. orange tree sitting down there on Arlington and Magnolia. Uh, that's what came was planted in 1880. So yeah, so their they, economy just got used to it, and they just have a fast yeah, turnover that, rate. They, they thought that was normal. With so, when we want to control, so, so when we want to control the ants, uh, there's a couple of methods that you can use. Um, remember, I was saying about the pruning, the sanitation. That's one way. Uh, the second one is I don't know if you guys have seen these. Uh, from what I understand, they're quite expensive. No. About well, thirty dollars, but if you have a thousand trees in organic, you have to place them one. I believe every six trees or five to six trees, you have to buy quite a few of them. And the only downfall about these guys is you really have to monitor them. If what is it? It's a so something pro. Amp pro. Yeah, it's a bait station. And for ants, yeah. And usually if you just have, you know, a minor problem, you can just throw one in your backyard. The only uh, downfall about these guys is that they can dry out and you not even know that they dried out. So, you know, if you know it's going to be a hot week or a hot month, you know, just check on it every once in a while. And um, they come with uh, a certain liquid that you can fill it up with. Um, but what most people do is they actually just make their own baits. However, be very careful, especially if you have pets, because <laughs> um, uh, these bait stations can um, really cause some damage, and you don't want to do that. So, um, or what about like lizards or frogs? Will it hurt? No. So okay. flies. No, because they don't eat sugar. So okay. They don't have any to go into the baits. Okay. Well, they have to make them yeah. method so the bees can't get them. That, so the, this, this excludes bees. Oh, this excludes okay. bees. That's good. And it kind of pays to go for the ants. Right. And the liquid isn't that toxic so that the workers can take it back to the hive. The problem with some of the borax mixtures is that it kills workers in transit, so it doesn't always get to the hive. Yeah. So it's one of those trade-offs. That's, that's, that's actually a really good point with regards to one of the reasons why we do not recommend and, and we 
Master Gardener program, do not recommend that um, the public make their own bait. Right. And the reason being is that, and we'll use the bait as an, the effectiveness of as a bait as, as an example. For uh, a borate based bait to be effective, it needs to be spot on with regards to the formulation so that it's not strong enough that it kills the workers before they get back to the hive, but it's not two weeks so that it doesn't do anything once they get back to the hive. So by, it can be very difficult for the layperson to actually create that bait and get it spot on so that it actually was supposed to be doing what it's, what it's intended to do. Uh, so that's, that's one of the, there's a whole other safety reason that we'll talk about in another program why we won't ask them to do it, but, but for the effectiveness, um, chances are probably more likely than not that the homeowner is not going to create a bait that's going to be effective. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I thought, I spent a lot of money on the fan pros. It did nothing. It did nothing. Nothing. Yeah, and all I bought all the things. But I have, my my big success has come with the tarot in here. Yes. And I don't know what they put in there, but the ants love it. And one of the things I found is that I just gotten rid of most of the ants in my yard. And I had a, I was like built on an ant. Yeah. But if you put them in a straight line, because ants like to go on a straight line, so uh, around your house or on trails, and put them every, you know, uh, 20 or 30 feet. I've got a once or twice, and they're gone. I don't know where they went, but they're gone. So, what is that called again? It's the tarot and it, it, it could be that the ants you're trying to control like protein and then this is a sugar based one, so that's why they weren't going for well, the sugar. Well these are Argentine ants, I mean they are Argentine ants, and they have much of them. I don't know. Yeah. I think they're, 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 they might like the protein. And ants are finicky. Sometimes they may be wanting the protein bait. They may be looking for a sweet bait. Yeah. Um, and, and the type of active ingredient um, can have an effect on it as well, depending on the species of ants. So um, if it doesn't work, it there's actually, and when you're in my office, um, next time you guys are in my office, remind me to show you one of the ant bait stations that I have. Um, and it's actually, it's a, it's a little green cup, and it's got two compartments in it. So you can actually use a protein-based or a sweet-based bait. You can drink different things to, to increase your uh, chances that, that your uh, bait is actually going to being taken by the ants. So. Kind of cafeteria style. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sir. No, no, I'm actually learning, so this is actually good. Um, so a lot of the calls you guys will probably get to are citrus leaf miner. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard of that already, or people are bringing samples. What's wrong with my tree? Um, this is probably one of the most popular pest calls that I usually get. Um, now, not by growers, but when I do help out the master gardeners or if they just drop off samples. Usually mature trees does nothing, just doesn't look very pretty. When you like prune them, just prune it back if it bothers you that much. Um, usually the smaller trees kind of goes the same way. Unless it's getting really hammered by it, you you know, you may want to um, you may want to do something about it if it's a smaller tree and and if you see it's really, you know, stunting its growth and not producing. Um, the nurse there's like at Lowe's and all the other places, you can buy um, a insecticide. So remember, your tree's going to be little. You just want to start treating it for that. Uh, you can also use soapy water, you know, just spray it off, you know, every once in a while. Um, and you can kind of predict, because remember, bugs, they seem to multiply when it gets hot, right? There's a certain threshold that they peak. So if you know it's going to be a hot week, maybe go out there with your soapy water and you know, go ahead and treat your tree. But usually, um, I've yet to see a tree die from this. So, um, the leaf miner is not as Does worm casting tea help with that too? I know some people that do that. For what? Worm casting tea. Like you do like a, make oh, a tea worm casting that. and spray it on the trees. <laughs> I've never heard of that. I don't know if fertilizer, like very weak fertilizer. It doesn't have any. Pat Welsh, Pat Welsh recommended it. 
pet, I took her pest management class at the Spring Master Gardener seminar last, last year. Uh, it's not a labeled insecticide. Yeah, there, there's no scientific uh, evidence that shows that worm castings have a, any insecticidal effect. Oh, interesting. I didn't know about that. And we love cat welch. <laughs> Will the citrus leaf cleaner attack other plants? Um, well, there's different species of leaf miner. Okay. Yeah, there's different, you know, but this one specifically is just citrus. I used to worm castings and it did help my trees. Either that or it was just magic. <laughs> <laughs> You're magic. You're putting it at the base. You probably like You're putting it around the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Base, dry, around the bottom. Yeah, Another popular thing um, that you'll see is red scale. Um, a lot of trees have this. And like I said, um, I've yet to see a tree die from this. I have seen smaller trees get hammered pretty bad because if they're all covered, it's, um, if the leaves, leaves and citrus are covered by the scale, what can't happen? Photosynthesis, exactly. So that would probably be your default, and then your tree will get weak and probably get some type of secondary um, thing wrong with it. Um, uh, most of the time, we do have, like I said, we have good biocontrol here in Southern California, so we're very fortunate for that. And uh, we do have bugs that will actually um, lay eggs to the red scale. So it kind of keeps itself in check, especially within the backyard. Uh, the larger growers, they do have a protocol where they do spray for it. Um, because the file control doesn't work as efficiently in a, a larger scale versus a smaller scale for that. Um, mealybugs, very <laughs> another common one that you'll see. And most of the time, like you'll see a tree have all three of those things. You know, you'll have um, the leaf miner on the leaves, and you have the mealybugs everywhere. You know, and usually trees can withstand a lot. And uh, the mealybugs, you can tell, they're, um, it's like a white wax. Do you guys see it clumped up? Uh, let me see if there's a, oh yeah, here's a better photo of it. Uh, this was a organic, a small organic grapefruit grove, and all of his trees had it. And, um, and I forgot what he sprayed with. He, he actually had to go buy um, an organic chemical and he sprayed it. And it still wasn't working. Well, what ended up happening is that he wasn't using enough pressure in his sprayer, so the so the so the so the chemical wasn't even penetrating into the tree to even get to it. So also, mm -hmm. this, if you want to take it into consideration, when you are treating, make sure you treat it uh, with the correct tools for that, because you can be like, hey, I'm spraying it and nothing's working. Well, do you have? The pressure for it is your gauge there, and he didn't have a gauge on it. And remember, he wasn't a backyard grower per se, but he did have quite a few trees where he could bring in the tractor equipment to spray it. And it took a couple of times because it, one, it was a organic solution, and two, he had to get the timing and pressure just right so it could actually penetrate into the leaves to actually um, get the mealybugs. Um, then there's a mealybug destroyer. Um, <laughs> you guys can actually go to I don't. Do you know of any stores that sell beneficials? Yeah. Not stores, but online. You can so just online? $15 to get a pack per, per organism. Oh, interesting. Okay. I just researched this week. Oh, wonderful. So there you go. It's $49 to special order from all friends. Interesting. So you can actually bring it. So if you feel that you want to go the beneficial route, and you see some change, but you want more, you know, you can actually buy them and release them into your backyard for the population that way. Um, there's a little larvae for it. Um, the mealybug itself, that's really close. Oh my gosh. Ooh, can you tell them apart? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you can tell them apart because the destroy, this destroyer moves and travels around and the mealybug stays there. Uh, yeah. Much. Yeah, and they're moving. Um, next, uh, uh, yes. snail. Okay. especially with all this rain, oh, yeah. this rain that we're getting. Okay, uh, with all this rain that we're getting, we're going to be seeing them a lot more. Um, they just damage your fruit. They make it not pretty, and I don't think you want to eat them. Um, like I said, you want to skirt the 
the millet you, you want to print your, your trees, you don't want to leave something like that for them to keep falling all over it. Uh, copper bands are really are really useful. So if you skirt, so if you skirt your tree and put this copper band, they won't be able to make it up the tree. Uh, snails, these are also another biocontrol that you can buy. Um, you want to release them when temperatures are above 50. Um, you don't want them to dry out when it's too cold. And they can usually control a, um, a population between four to six years. Um, but you want to make sure that also they have a food source and that's that litter that falls down on the bottom. Um, we're going to diseases. Brown rot, this is probably one of the most common things that comes through the office. Uh, you can kind of tell um, brown rot because it has a firm leathery spot. It has a really um, strong smell as well. And then usually if they've had it for a while, um, th this, the picture on the bottom isn't citrus, but I just want to show how fruit looks when it's a mummy. That's technically what, it, what it's called. And um, if you start seeing that, you want to pick it up and clean it up as soon as you can because it can start to cycle all over again for it. Um, usually, um, the fungus resumes growth in the spring. You start seeing that during the spring, take them out. Um, and you want to take away the, the, the mummies, like I mentioned before. Um, this can be difficult to control. Like I said, the best thing is sanitation for it. Um, Phytophthora gamosis. Next popular thing that you, that that comes that comes through the office, leaves turn yellow and drop. Means it's sap oozes uh, from the trunk. Um, it's more pronounced during the spring. Uh, the best way to do that is you want to make sure that there's no moisture hitting the bark. Like if you have a sprinkler that's just hitting the bark, that will actually set it up for failure and actually get the tree sick. Um, like I said, this, this is the biggest thing that you'll see the biggest symptom is actual oozing. Um, sometimes you won't even know it's there because if it's raining, the rain can wash the gummies so you technically won't have symptoms, but just keep an eye out for that. Um, he's telling me I only have four minutes left, so <laughs> I'm going. Um, I wanted to do this fun little case study with you guys to see how much you guys have been studying. So the leaves have been gradually dropping from my tree. The leaves on the tree are yellow. The canopy is so thin I can see the sky through it and the leaves tend to be very small. If you get a phone call like that and get a picture, what do you guys think is going on? By Topra. This is probably the, the most calls that I usually get. Um, too much water, not enough water. Like I said, how I like to see Phytophthora is it's all over the place. It's almost equivalent to like a staph infection for people. It's all over the place, but it depends how vulnerable and sick you are is when you get it. So it's kind of like the same thing with trees. You know, there has to, uh, most of the time it's a secondary thing, whether the roots get nippled on by gophers and it goes in that way, or um, drought stress, your tree's all stressed out and it gets this infection. So, um, that's probably one of the most popular things that I see. And and sometimes it's kind of hard. Sometimes when I go out to a grove, I have to, to test for nematodes because they have the same, they have the same um, symptoms. And usually with the trees that were planted like 30, 40 years ago, we didn't have that resistant rootstock yet. So you kind of have to play detective and you know try to trace back your steps for that. Um, you don't want to put too much water. That's probably what usually causes it the most with extreme moisture. There's no air going through it, so the roots get really stressed out. Um, the way this thing gets spread, and I've seen this time and time again, um, a small grower has maybe 10 or 12 trees. Hey, one of my trees is dying. I'm gonna use the clippers and, and bring it down. And then two weeks later, I'm gonna prune the healthy trees. Guess what, you just transferred it on there. So always clean your tools. And if you let someone borrow your tools or vice versa, make sure you always clean them. Usually like a 50-50 bleach solution works fairly well. And if I know I'm going into a Phytophthora grove, I always switch out my shoes. If not, then I bleach them as well because I can easily take that to someone else's house. Um, dry root rot for citrus is also another one that you want to um, look out for. Um, it weakens the roots and trunks. Um, the same thing with like the gophers. It's, it works very, very similar to what the other one is. Um, rot splitting navel. Uh, actually, this was 
there's a, there's a certain strain that's been hitting the pomegranates this past year. You, they look perfectly fine in the outside when you cut them in half. They're all rotten in the hard core of it. Um, so the alternaria is one you gotta look out for. Um, blue and green mold, we've all seen that. Um, that's usually a post-harvest thing. Um, I've been seeing a lot of this, the stem, the stem rot, stem because of the rain. Um, it's what happens when it happens in the softening tissue on the top and bottom, and there's a rapid decay that goes down the middle of it. And usually this is caused by a lot of back-to-back -back rain, and the tree doesn't have enough time to dry out. Um, or if you do harvest and keep them in a moist environment, this can usually happen as well. Or I've also seen if you leave them on the tree too long when they're ready to harvest, and there's a really heavy rain or a back-to-back -back rain that can also happen as well. Now we're gonna play a little game. So I went into a grove and I saw damage on the bottom part of the bark and it left behind this on the right side. What do you guys think it is? Deer. Deer. Believe it or not, I've seen a lot of deer damage. And sometimes they can even um, rub their horns against the bark as well. Uh, rats. Uh, rats. Yeah, rats. Very good. So the, the picture to the right, they pulled it straight up from the ground. There are no roots. Gophers. Gophers, absolutely. This is probably the second biggest thing that I've seen that people say that, hey, my tree's dying, I don't know what's going on, and on my way to the grove, I trip like on two holes. <laughs> so, you know, or like literally you push over the tree and just falls over and there's no roots. So, heartbreaking. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>